why did you join the military in the first place? Like, what, what are what are your? I'm going to ask you more about the motivations of the book, but I guess it would be good to understand your general motivations for being there in the first place. Motivations change with time. Uh, I was a poor student in high school. I wasn't interested in understanding or taking my schooling seriously. Let's put it that way. But I was a very good basketball player. And so the Air Force Academy basketball coaches came and happened to watch me play a basketball game uh, early on in, in high school when I had one of the best games of my life. And every time Air Force showed up to watch, I had a fantastic performance. And every time other colleges I was really hoping to go to showed up, I had some of the worst games of my high school career. And so I ended up being recruited to play basketball at the Air Force Academy and took a recruiting visit out and really was impressed with the different lifestyle and discipline of the young cadets at the Air Force Academy. And because of, thankfully, uh, the insight of wise parents, they kind of nudged me in that direction. And I joined the military by what going to the Air Force Academy. Now, I didn't play basketball for very long there. Uh, that was a hard balance doing military life on the one hand and being an intercollegiate athlete on the other. But over time, at the Air Force Academy, they had an honor code. We do not lie, steal, or cheat, nor tolerate among us anyone who does. And uh, for the first time in my life, perhaps, I started to take very seriously certain values or principles like not lying or, or cheating. And from there, it kind of evolved into taking my studies more seriously and not, and not just trying to get by, but actually maybe starting to read and understand history a little bit. And the more that I learned about history, and the more I learned about other countries, the more I learned about the history of our own country, the more patriotic I became. And I'll clarify, sadly, that you have to because there's a new category of extremism these days. It's called patriot extremism. Uh, and it's someone who's overly zealous in their patriotism. Uh, not in an overly zealous way did I become patriotic. I simply became a lover of my country. And by the time I graduated from the Air Force Academy, I was happy to stay in the service, sign up to commission as an officer, and with each passing year or certainly decade, uh, I've been more and more grateful to serve in uniform to defend our nation, to defend our allies and the rights of liberal Western democracies, particularly in the world, who insist upon the worth of the individual and who insist that uh, men and women have rights that shouldn't be violated. And we stand for a great thing in uniform and we're willing to defend uh, the Constitution, which preserves those liberties. This thesis, I guess, was kind of a precursor in multiple ways, in more ways than one, to you needing to write, in your own words, needing to write Irresistible Revolution. Why don't I ask this question now? You know, why is it irresistible? Why is the revolution? What, I mean, what is the revolution, of course, is the other question. But why is it irresistible? Irresistible Revolution comes from a quote from one of the founders of the Black Lives Matter movement, Janiyah Khan. Uh, I think Janiyah Khan goes by Future Khan, uh, deliberately so. That's, if you think about that, Future Khan, uh, that's an interesting name title that uh, they've chosen for themselves. Future Khan said that the role of the artist is to make the revolution irresistible. I want everyone to think about that for just a moment. The role of the artist, and they think they've got some artists mixed up in, in those who have organized the Black Lives Matter movement. They are trained Marxist organizers. They've admitted as much as early as at least 2015 in interviews. And now they've got self-professed artists among them whose, whose sole purpose in the movement is to craft the rhetoric in such a way that the revolutionary impulse sweeps across the nation, the, the nation because people will buy into the aims of the organization as almost a foregone conclusion. Who doesn't love freedom? Who doesn't love equality? Who doesn't love liberty and fairness? And these words that are thrown about so quickly, there is even the potential that compassionate people can be swept up, at least initially, into what they would perceive as a virtuous cause in liberating other humans from some oppressor class. That narrative you recognize from 1848 Communist Manifesto 
Uh, it used to be economic stratification into classes, the bourgeoisie and the proletariat. Uh, and that's morphed over time with other Marxist academics who have changed the narrative over and over again based on what country they sit in to whichever particular narrative will have the most staying power within whatever nation they happen to sit in. And in America, perhaps the most powerful narrative you can capitalize on is the narrative of racism, of slavery. Uh, those institutions and historical follies are at odds with our founding principles. Frederick Douglass knew it. Our founders, many of them knew it too, and were trying to pave a way for its abolishment. And because our nation in our founding philosophy is at odds with those ugly historical artifacts, let's say, people try and resurrect those and bring them to the forefront of people's minds in order to create a kind of... Um, ideologically driven narrative of of American society that people can get angry about once again, because we're losing our ability to get angry about what America is, if you actually understand what it is and what it's done, because it's become great, and it's done great things for humans. And, and so we try and resurrect Thomas Sowell, I quote this in the book, but Thomas Sowell said, racism is not dead, but it's kept alive by race hustlers and politicians and, and people of the like who who profit from keeping it alive. And and I see that in these narratives that are constantly spread about in like the New York Times 1619 project and, and in our diversity, equity and inclusion trainings where we're, we're insistent upon demonizing America uh, as a country and its foundings and its founders and its founding documents so that we can get people energized around a revolutionary cause. And they don't exactly word it that way, but if you trace through all the details, you understand very well that there are those interested in in a revolutionary change to this country. And Marx and Engels would say that that communist revolution can't possibly be fully brought about in a place like America without violence. And if you start to understand those themes, uh, the Epic Times uh, nine commentaries, as well as uh, how the specter of communism is ruling our world. And if they read my book, what they'll see is that they'll start to make a great deal more sense of some of the events that they saw unfolding in this country in the year 2020 after George Floyd's death. A lot of that revolutionary fervor is fueled by these ideas. They know those who are interested in the revolutionary cause and in undermining American society that you're not going to do that in an instant. And so even though there have been revolutionary changes that have occurred in a year alone, the soils have had to be prepared for decades. This is, this is something that has been in the making for many decades in the university, um, in, our, in, in politics, um, even unfortunately in our churches, the changing of language, the changing of terms, definitions, subtly over time can remake a, a society and a culture if you give it enough time. And so the soils have been prepared for a very long time. And of course, the revolutionary cause thrives when a crisis occurs. And so whether or not the crisis is actually a justifiable revolutionary cause, revolutionaries can make it such. And George Floyd's death, which we mentioned earlier, was one such example of an opportunity that people capitalized on, uh, they destroyed cities. I mean, they destroyed businesses. Uh, the COVID pandemic, no one can argue with the fact that the crisis itself has presented an opportunity for people to make radical changes to society economically, socially, or politically.